very warm welcome to this evening, tonight, I should say. A special welcome to Lauren Amanda's pastor who are here um, this evening in the auditorium uh, and others joining us here and those of you joining us online, on live stream. <clears throat> so this is the third of our reflections and uh, tomorrow, of course, is Good Friday, so I imagine many of you now, if you haven't been already, are on holiday, so that's nice. Um, we're going to begin this evening's um, reflection by listening to a reading from John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 11. So can I... It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well then, Lord, said Peter, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, although not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reading of Scripture. We uh, approaching a very important part, very uh, poignant part of the Passion Week. And we pray this evening uh, you'd open our eyes afresh to things perhaps that we've seen or heard many times, but something new, something that will strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> well, we've been using our noses this week to smell our way through the passion story. Somebody said to me it was a very novel approach, uh, and it is. Um, but it's there in the text, really. Um, certainly in chapter 11, the, the odor that was emanating, the odor, of the, the odor of death that was emanating, actually, from the tomb of Lazarus that, that um, Jesus called him out of. Uh, and Karen reflected on that last night. The night before that, of course, the chapter 12, the next chapter, the smell of perfume, as Mary Bethany breaks open the, the vial of, 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 of ointment and anoints Jesus for his burial. So that's, those two stories are set alongside each other. And now chapter 13, one of the most astonishing chapters or moments in the whole of Scripture is the one <coughs> who, let's face it, he could have ordered a throne to be brought into that upper room. It would have been appropriate. Instead, he gets up from the meal, he takes off his outer clothing, I'm going to do that, and he wraps a towel around his waist, and he pours uh, water in the pitcher, as the Americans call it, and then begins to wash the disciples' feet, which are 
Well, certainly dirty, if not smelly. <laughs> Maybe tonight's is a little more of a tenuous link. <laughs> uh, unless, of course, you know anything about feet. And so you know that this is... Um, well, it's, it's actually significant. Jesus' feet in chapter 12. Now he's washing the feet of the disciples, including Judas. Amazing. I imagine he included Judas. And <coughs> why Peter objected to this is the reason why I think we all reject it or object to it to some degree. Because we don't want to be indebted or beholden uh, to anyone, least of all God himself, or perhaps most of all God himself, in our natural state. We don't want to be indebted. Give us a chance to serve, and we kind of know what we're doing, most of us, yeah? In a strange kind of way, when you serve, you kind of have control. And you know what you're doing. And maybe don't feel so vulnerable. But to allow, to allow Jesus to serve you um, is to make us beholden to him. Or make Peter beholden to him. And, and sometimes we can't bear that. Or it makes us uncomfortable. Awkward. And so Peter says, doesn't he? You shall, ne you shall never wash my feet. Um, to which Jesus replies, Well, unless I wash your feet, you'll have no part with me. Because the gospel, in its fundamental sense, its most original sense, is not what we do for God. And that all comes later. You know, there's plenty of time for that. We will do things for God eventually. We will do things in his name eventually. But that's not the fundamental heart of the gospel. The gospel is what God does for us. He stoops down, becomes a servant. The Son of Man did not come, as Jesus says in Mark's gospel, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so then, <laughs> typical Peter, he says, he says, oh, okay then, all right. Then. You know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Not just my feet, but, but my hands and my head as well. You know, now he goes, you know, big gesture. He's always the big gesture guy. Typical Peter and, and typically stupid Because if you've had a bath, and a Christian, we're going to see this on Sunday night, as a Christian, by definition, you've had a bath. You're washed, clean. And Jesus is ramping up the conversation here. If you've had a bath, then you're clean. So all you need to do is have your feet washed and cleansed. And, and that's what Jesus does for us washes us clean and then he keeps tending to the smelly bits <laughs> that we the dirty bits that from time to time we we present and even that he comes to serve us and wash us and renew us and give us hope if we if we are to serve in Jesus name We first must allow ourselves to receive in Jesus' name. Otherwise, our service will be carnal, not spiritual. It will have a tinge, always it will have that tinge of pride. So Jesus has to serve us first. And, and we humbly receive him. In this way, I've been reading, uh, rereading, in my opinion, the best commentary on John 
I have had hundreds of copies of this. I've given away hardback. And I found this copy in paperback, so at least I could refer to it today. And William Temple, he was Archbishop during the Second World War. Died in 1942, I think, during the war. Great, great uh, spiritual leader. This is a brilliant, brilliant commentary. It's kind of a devotional commentary. And he says, uh, We shrink from this revelation. We are ready perhaps to be humble before God, but we do not want him to be humble in his dealings with us. <laughs> we should like him who has the right to glory in his goodness and greatness. Then we, as we pass from his presence, may be entitled to pride ourselves on such achievements as distinguish us above other people. You know? And then he says, he says a little bit later on, Man's humility does not begin with the giving of service. That, doesn't, that sounds odd, doesn't it? It doesn't begin with the beginning of service. It begins with the readiness to receive it. And when we receive it, then we can serve. And, and serve in a way that excludes us from all boasting. But just bring the gospel down to bare essentials, which is, I heard a definition, Karen might preach, I'm sure you've heard this, Karen, of evangelism. What's evangelism? You know, is it my selling of my gifts? And whatever? Evangelism is just one beggar yeah. telling another beggar where to find bread. And that's, that's the gospel. We're going to watch a video now, a YouTube video, of the scene in the upper room where Jesus uh, washes the disciples' feet. And then this will take us also into the second part of this reading, where, of course, Jesus, having cleansed us, caused us to receive from him, will call us to also serve and give in his name. So, um, Tim, if we could play... What I say then is what the Father has told me to say. It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He had always loved those in the world who were his own, and he loved them to the very end. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel round his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter. Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Never at any time will you wash my feet. 
If I do not wash your feet, you will no longer be my disciple. Lord, do not wash only my feet, then. Wash my hands and head, too. <laughs> Those who have taken a bath are completely clean and do not need to wash themselves, except for their feet. All of you are clean. All except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, all of you except one are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have just done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And it is right that you should do so because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you. So that you will do just what I have done for you. I am telling you the truth. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. interesting that Jesus changes the, the tone of the conversation, the direction of the conversation away from um, what we've been talking about to talking about serving, serving one another, loving one another, washing each other's feet. Uh, we're going to sing a song uh, to reflect that. Um, this is our God, the Servant King. And it's really great that Tim's here this evening. To, uh, to sing this to us and um, actually I'm going to invite if you'd like to stand as well and here in the auditorium we're going to sing this together and worship the Lord
going to come and bring a reading to us, a second reading for this evening from Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. And scholars have often noted the, the echoes of this passage to the passage in John chapter 13. Uh, it may well even be that, that uh, one is a reflection of the other, though which way around we're not quite sure. So Oliver, uh, it's great to have you here this evening. It's great to have the young adults here on Tuesday night, so come and bring the reading to us. This is Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11, imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the, in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the time of Jesus, every knee should bow, at the name of Jesus, every name should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father, of God the Father. Amen. So we come to the end of this reflection. Um, Karen is going to um, serve us now. 
if you'd like to come. And we've um, asked just a few people if they'd like to come and have their feet washed as, uh, um, as a, an honoring of this story. <clears throat> In some traditions, this is a very, very big event uh, on uh, Monday, Thursday. Uh, we thought we would do something a little bit more modest, but, but no less vivid and uh, graphic. So, Karen, would you like to come and... Uh, So I think we've got a couple of um, volunteers who have agreed to have their feet washed. Um, if anyone else would particularly like to have their feet washed, we've got two more bowls. So if you just come and sit down here, um, we can wash your feet later too. Maunday Thursday actually receives its name from um, the mandatum, the commandment given by Jesus. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. And whether you're taking part in this or watching uh, at home or in the auditorium, um, may this be a sign of the love that God has lavished on us and the love he calls us into.
One of his books, The Methodist Preacher, uh, A. Whitman, muses on the possibility of there being a museum in heaven exhibiting tokens of uh, spiritual leadership. And in that museum, you might expect to find uh, Moses' staff and Aaron's rod, the one that was budded, uh, the ink pot that Luther apparently threw at the devil when he was angry, John Wesley's saddle and stirrups, Praying Hyde's knee patches, Billy Graham's air tickets. But he he mused on this and he said two things that would be conspicuous by their absence would be the towel and the basin, for the good reason that they're still in use. God still calls us to serve now one another. And uh, let's close our service just with that chorus from that song again. This is our God, the Servant King. Father, we thank you as we encounter this story, this great encouragement reminder that we are clean through and through. We thank you on Sunday night we're going to witness in baptism the power of the gospel to to cleanse and to forgive and to heal. We pray for all of those being baptized as they prepare. Thank you, Lord, that you go on cleansing us as we offer to you our lives, our brokenness, our sins. You are gracious, faithful, as we confess and come in humility. And Lord, you call us now, for the rest of the days that we have, to live and to serve in the power and the grace that you've supplied in our lives. So may we be thus towards one another and as we go into the world. Give us a servant heart, which is your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. A reminder that tomorrow morning is a walk of witness at 10.30 meeting outside the friary. So, (coughs) 
yeah, there's a board. Uh, um, Karen will be carrying the board. <laughs> so, and then at 2.30, we have an all-age celebration here in the uh, auditorium. We're looking forward to that. There's a lot of people coming. So um, that's at 2.30. And then at 7.30 tomorrow evening, we have communion service here till about 8.30. So looking forward to tomorrow. God bless you on your way. Thank you for coming this evening.